answered the question, is trust in God juvenile? That was our message last Sunday or last Wednesday night. The context was that the leaders of Judah had formed a covenant with one nation so that they could be spared from another nation. And uh, that was their plan. Uh, They wanted it to be complex. They wanted to figure it out themselves. They didn't want the simplicity, just the, the basic idea of just trust God. Just trust God. That's what Isaiah's message was. You don't have to go figuring everything out. You don't have to go analyzing everything. You don't have to uh, work yourself up into all this strategy because God said he'd take care of you. You just trust God as a nation. God will take care of you. Uh, And so that was Isaiah's message, but he was laughed to scorn. Isaiah was mocked. They said, you're just, that's juvenile. You're just teaching kindergarten. You're just teaching preschool. That's just here, there, precept upon precept. There a little, here a little. We're, we're the pros. We're the experts. Uh, we're, we're beyond that. And so they laughed at him and mocked him. Uh, and, but of course, trust in God is not juvenile. And, and so we find that out in this next section that we'll see this evening. Uh, Isaiah comes up with a name for the alliance that they have agreed upon. Uh, they have made a, a pact with Egypt to assist in preserving them from Assyria. Uh, Assyria is the, the largest power at the time. Uh, and so they think that this Diplom- this diplomatic agreement will, will spare their lives, but it will do the opposite. They think it guarantees their safety, but uh, so Isaiah comes up with a nickname. You know, some of these politicians, they have nicknames for all of their opponents, and, uh, and Isaiah came up with a nickname for the political agreement that uh, Judah had come to. He said, you know what that is? Your, your handshake and your great strategy with, with Egypt is a covenant with death. It's a covenant with death. He used that phrase twice in these next five verses that we'll see this evening because God controls death. It is the living God who grants life. It's an amazing thing that life is in God's hands. Every child that's born is because God granted life. God longs to grant life. He he delights in being the source of life. He is life abundant. He is life everlasting. Jesus said, I am the life. And so life is sacred. Life is important, and but he also appoints death. Uh, he tells us that in his word, that he is the both the grantor of life and the appointer of death. And so God had promised Israel and Judah, if you trust in me as a nation, you will live, and I'm able to see to it. <laughs> I, I can make sure you live. But if you put your trust elsewhere, whether it's in your inventions, your strategies, another army, another government, another religion, if you place your trust elsewhere— you won't live. And I control life and I control death. And as a nation, I can give you life. I can give you death. You put your trust in me, you live. You put your trust elsewhere, you die. And so they had just brilliantly figured out their trust being elsewhere. So the the response is you die. That is what God says. It's a covenant with death. The covenant that they thought would preserve their life was a covenant with death. So that's that's kind of dark and sad and depressing and... (laughs) Uh, but, but out of that dark, tragic backdrop, in our next passage here, emerges a, a, a doctrine that is merciful and gracious and vital. Vital meaning having to do with life. And, and it's a doctrine that is uh, referenced throughout the New Testament. And uh, it's referenced by the primary principles, the main characters of the New Testament. The Gospels, of course, Jesus Christ himself is the main character. He refers to it. And then you get into the the epistles, and Paul obviously wrote most of the New Testament books. He refers to it. And the other one, who Peter was really kind of the bridge from Jesus to Paul. Peter walked with Jesus. Peter was the main preacher of the Gospel in the book of Acts before the conversion of Paul, when Paul kind of becomes the main character. So those are really your three main characters of the New Testament, Jesus, Peter, Peter. And Paul, and and each of them touched on the doctrine that emerges and uses and refers to the analogy that we find in the passage uh, that we'll have this evening. And so with that in mind, let's look at uh, Isaiah chapter 28. And we left off at verse 14. We'll begin in verse 15 this evening. Isaiah 28, verse 15. Because ye have said we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. Now understand, of course, Those weren't the words they chose. Isaiah is telling them, 
his assessment of what was in their minds. Of course, they didn't say, yes, we would like to make a covenant with death, please. He, Isaiah is characterizing it himself, but he's nicknaming their, their ideas here. Uh, because ye have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell, are we at agreement? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, here it is. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place, and your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. From the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation uh, only to understand the report. Uh, verse 16 really being the focus of this passage, that God says, I will lay in Zion a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. That's the verse that's referred to a number of times elsewhere in scripture. It's amazing as we go through Isaiah, how often we find that Isaiah is the source of so much of the New Testament. Almost all of, almost every chapter of Romans refers to, uh, to Isaiah, really as the underpinnings of much of the New Testament. So God here says that because man's trust in himself, because man's trust in himself and in his own inventions and in his own ideas can only produce death and result in hell, something must be done. Our own ideas, our own, our own inventions, our own imaginations by themselves can result in nothing but hell and can produce nothing but death. We need help. We need him. And, and so he says, I'll give you a cornerstone. I'll lay in Zion a stone, a sure foundation, a tried, precious stone. So our message this evening is titled, Jesus Christ, the Cornerstone. Jesus Christ, the Cornerstone. In Bible times, uh, the primary material to build a building was stone. Uh, the cornerstone was the most important piece of the building. Uh, and so when the Stone masons would go to erect a building. Uh, the, the most important piece was the cornerstone. They had to find a, a perfectly shaped stone to build a, a reliable building that would remain intact and would endure for years to come. It was so important to find the right stone to start off the building. They had to set it just right because everything else in the building was going to be built out from that first stone, from that first cornerstone. And so they had to set it perfectly. Some of you have been involved in construction. You probably know more about that than I do. But, but if that cornerstone wasn't set just right, everything else was going to be off. Everything else was going to be crooked. The walls aren't going to be straight. The other corners won't be at the proper angle. The rest of the house isn't going to come together if the cornerstone doesn't sort of set the tone for the, the building just perfectly. If the cornerstone was a little off, the rest of the building would be crooked. It would be faulty. And it would be vulnerable to collapse. So you can already see the spiritual lesson that God has for us, that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He is the first important piece in building a life. Our life is the house. My life is the building, the, the structure, the edifice. And it has to be built on the rock of Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone and everything else is to be built out from him. He, I mean, he is, he is the one that is to, to be the source and that first building stone, that first block of everything in my life. My views, my thought, my opinions, my beliefs, they all come from him. He's the cornerstone. My relationships, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, parent, child, friend, it's part of the building of our life. Our thoughts, our beliefs, our positions, our relationships, our friends. They should all flow from that first cornerstone, the one who, that we're building our life on. My thoughts should come from that cornerstone. My vocabulary, the words that I choose, these are all things that make up our life. My goals should have to do with the cornerstone of my life. My priorities, 
what's most important to me should come from that cornerstone. The way that I make decisions through prayer, through evaluating what God says is important. The way that I, what I choose to participate in, what I support, what I promote, what I oppose should all come from that first part of my life, the first cornerstone of my life. Uh, What kinds of things I'm willing to do for money? What kinds of things I'm not willing to do for money? How to manage my money? How to spend my money? These are all parts parts of the, the building of our life that need to flow from the cornerstone that sets the direction and aligns the direction of the building, aligns the direction of our life. What I put into my body. I should get my understanding of what goes into my body from the cornerstone of my life. What I allow my eyes to see. What I allow my ears to hear. Those should be walls and furnishings that come from the cornerstone. The way I treat people. The way I respond to disappointment. These are all parts of our life. We we encounter all of these things. They all need to come. How we do all of that needs to come from our cornerstone. Got to have the the right block in for the other stuff to be right. Because if we don't have the right cornerstone, we've got, uh, just like it would be a faulty building, that's liable to collapse, so will be our lives. You build your life without the right cornerstone, you're going to get a life that's crooked. You're going to get a life that's faulty. You're going to get a life that's vulnerable to collapse without the right cornerstone in place. All of the weight of the structure must rest on that one stone. If the, if the one stone is removed, the whole structure falls. And so you've got to have a cornerstone that's strong. You've got to have a cornerstone that's has the power and strength to withstand all of the weight and all of the pressure and all of the load, all of the burden. Uh, It can bear the burden. And you've got burdens in your life. You've got to have a cornerstone that's strong enough to withhold and to to lift the weight of all the worry and lift the weight of all the pressure and all the things that sometimes feels like bear down on us. We've got to have a cornerstone that can bear that weight. And Isaiah tells them that your, your agreement with Egypt can't do it. It's insufficient to bear the burden. It's insufficient to bear the burden of sustaining your life. Our ideas, our inventions, insufficient to bear the burden. But Jesus Christ is the great burden bearer. Come unto me, all you that labor. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. For him, it's easy. He upholds all things by the word of his power. All power is given unto him. He has all the strength. He is strength. There is no such thing as strength. There is no such thing as power apart from Jesus Christ, the God, the Son, our Savior. He can bear all of our burdens. This is not the first time in Scripture that this analogy, this idea of a cornerstone is brought up. In fact, this is the third. And the three verses come together, and and each one has their necessary piece of this illustration, of this analogy And when the New Testament writers, when Jesus and Peter and Paul make reference to this analogy, they take these three verses all together. They, they, in one sentence, will give a little piece of one, a little piece of this one, and a little piece of that one. And so certain words link passages of Scripture. And this particular analogy and illustration about the cornerstone, this is the third piece of it, the third leg of it. The first one is Psalm 118, verse 21 and 22. The other one is Isaiah 8 and verse 14. Uh, So here's, I'll read it to you. This is Psalm 118, verse 2. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So that's Psalm 118. The second piece of it is Isaiah 8, 14. Isaiah 8, 14 And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the house of Israel, for a gin, for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So you put together chapter 28 here, verse 16, and you you put that with Psalm 118, verses 21 through 23. And you add on top of that Isaiah 8, 14. and, And there's a picture of the coming Messiah that emerges. It generates a profile of the the Messiah who would come, who would be this cornerstone. Uh, He would be laid in Zion. It says, behold, I lay in Zion there in verse 16. That's where he would be. He'd be placed or laid in Zion. According to Psalm 18, thou art my salvation. There would be a cornerstone that would be given in Zion that would be for our salvation. 
uh, that's what Psalm 118 says there. Uh, and that's the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Sound like the gospel to you? Uh, a Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, uh, ministers in and around Jerusalem. It is marvelous in our eyes. It is the Lord's doing and it is for our salvation. But it continues, according to this chapter here, he would be precious. He would be a sure foundation to all who believe, but he would also be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he would also be the stone in which builders refused and rejected, according to Psalm 118. So Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. Let me just give you a few uh, aspects of, of him as the cornerstone this evening. Number one, a rejected cornerstone. A rejected cornerstone. Psalm 118 there, it says, uh, the stone which the builders refused. Now, stone masons in Bible times uh, had an ability to discern and select and assess which stones were to be refused, which stones were to be used, and which stones were to be discarded. This was their trade they were very good at. These are people who build buildings out of stone. And so they're, uh, they got a big pile of stones, and they're putting them into a, putting a building together. And so they had an uncanny ability to just grab blindly a pile of stones and, and very quickly assess, all right, the one in my hand, what's the best spot to put it in where it can be used most advantageously to its own, uh, its own nature? Uh, and, and they could assess very quickly, all right, this one is hollow. This one's defective. This one's, uh, I'm going to have trouble if I rely on this one because there's going to be others on top of it. And so if I put this defective hollow one in that can't bear any weight and can't be relied on, then eventually the whole thing is going to have to come down, and I'm going to have to do all this all over again. So they got very good at figuring out, all right, this goes here, this goes here, boom, 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 boom. Uh, I read an account of somebody who watched this process. Just was amazed at just how quickly this goes here. It's like just playing a video game, you know, the Tetris. This goes here, this goes here, boom, boom. Uh, but they come on, well, this is no good, and pitch it, chuck it, discard it, refuse it. It's not good for anything. No, no weight can be born uh, on that stone. And so the analogy is, how silly is it? to come upon the perfect cornerstone, the, the flawless cornerstone that has no defects, has no blemishes, has no warts, and as a builder to say, ask it for nothing. I can't use that. It's absurd. Uh, how, how contrary to their own profession, how contrary to their own <laughs> supposed expertise, uh, that wouldn't be a very impressive stone worker to, to discard one that would have been the one that really would have been perfect in building the building the way it was meant to be built. Well, look at this. The boss says, hey, it's toppling over. What's wrong with it? Well, I couldn't find anything good. Well, there's a perfect one right there. Why don't you use that? And so that's what they do when they reject Christ. And now, now Jesus quotes that verse, Psalm 118, verses 21 through 23. And he specifically quotes that verse after giving a parable because the psalm summarizes the parable. And it's the parable of uh, the husbandman in the vineyard. There's a householder who plants a vineyard. And he goes away and he hires servants to work the vineyard. He, he hires husbandmen, pardon me, to work the vineyard. And every little while he sends his servants to go collect the fruits of the vineyard. Uh, and the first servant shows up at the vineyard and says to the husbandman, I've been sent from the owner. I'm here to collect the dividends. I'm here to collect the fruit. And they kill him. They stone him, beat him, kill him. Well, let me send another one. See if the other one fares any better. I wonder if the second one was maybe a larger individual or somebody uh, more well-prepared for uh, fisticuffs. I don't know, but they kill him too and beat him too and stone him. So the owner of the vineyard says, maybe my son, the my sonville reverence. And so he sends his own son. And, uh, and of course, the evil murderous husbandmen say, this is the heir. We really got to kill him. And they cast him out and kill him. And of course, the parable, he is the son. The prophets were the servants who were killed. And Jesus says, he's speaking of his own death. He's prophesying of his own death. I am the son of God, and yet you're going to kill me. And that's when he proceeded to quote Psalm 118. He said, know ye not the scriptures. Uh, Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He was confirming that he is the stone of Isaiah 8, Psalm 118, and Isaiah 28. Uh, he, he's the one that fulfills those things, but, but the chief priests and the Pharisees were the ones that were going to do the killing. And, and it's interesting that Jesus gives the parable, 
And then Jesus quotes Psalm 118, and the Bible says a couple of verses later in Matthew 21 that, that the chief priests and Pharisees perceived that he spake of them. That they were told they were going to kill him, and they, they fulfilled that just like he said they would. But they're the ones who refused. They, they refused and rejected the one that's become the head of the corner. He's become the cornerstone of my life, but they refused it. He's become the cornerstone of Peter's life and, and Paul and the others, but the chief priests and Pharisees refused and rejected it. But not only did Jesus refer to that analogy, but, but Paul did as well. Romans, thir- Romans 9, 32 to 33. It says, Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, that's Isaiah 8, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion, that's Isaiah 28, a stumbling stone and rock of offense, that's Isaiah 8, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, that's Isaiah 28. So in that one passage in Romans 9, uh, Paul, and you look at what Jesus said there in Matthew 21, they're tying those three passages together. Psalm 118, Isaiah 8, 14, Isaiah 28, 16. The priests and Pharisees treated him like a stumbling stone. That was the prophecy of Isaiah 8, 14, that even though for us, he's the cornerstone that we build our whole lives on, even though he's the source of all that we do, those that reject him and refuse him, they do that because they got offended. For them, he was a stumbling stone. You think of when times you've stumbled, you, when you stumble over something, it's just an annoyance and a nuisance that got in your way of what you wanted to do. I think Gary's laughing because of my dog, probably, in the, in the way of everything. And, you know, but like you, whether you step on the ottoman, whether you step on a toy, whether, whether you, you, know, you get a stumbling stone, you stumble over something in the night, you're annoyed and it's a nuisance because it just got in the way of where you wanted to go and what you wanted to do. And, and God prophesied that that's what the gospel of Christ would be. It would be a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Rather than being the cornerstone, as it ought to be, for those that refuse and reject him, it's something they stumble over. He's just a nuisance and an annoyance in the way of what they want to do. That's what he was. That's what the gospel of Christ was for the chief priests and scribes and Pharisees. And when Paul is writing in Romans 9, he's not. He's sort of speaking of chief priests and scribes and Pharisees. He's speaking of the, the unsaved Jews who opposed his ministry. Uh, who the book of uh, you know, Galatians is, is, uh, is geared toward as well. Why do they stumble? Because he's a rock of offense. It's offensive when you believe that your works can get you there. When you believe that you can be good enough, when you believe that you can satisfy the Mosaic law well enough to get yourself to heaven, when you think you can boast about how law abiding you are, pride, you get prideful. And when Jesus appears in the scene, or Paul appears in the scene and says, you can't be good enough, you're dirty, you're filthy, no one could ever obey the law, you need a Savior, you need Jesus, you need his righteousness, uh, he fulfilled it, he's the one, uh, the, the law was simply a schoolmaster to show you you need him, they get offended. He's just getting in their way. He's just messing up what they want to do, and, and they get offended at that because their pride is hurt. It's interesting that We don't like to be offensive. Uh, No Christian should try to offend. But God describes his own gospel and his own son as a rock of offense. And so if we are truly preaching Christ biblically, the way God describes his own son and his own gospel, we will offend. We don't seek to offend, but God tells us it's going to happen. So we don't want to hurt people's feelings. We don't want to go out and offend. But... If we never, ever offend anybody, and if everybody always loves us, and if everybody's feelings are always perfectly intact, and if no one ever feels guilty, and no one ever feels wrong, no one ever is humbled, no one's ever offended, you got to really ask if you're really preaching Christ biblically. And there are, there are churches where everything's just all feel good, and they tell you how good you are. I would venture to say they're not preaching Christ, because that's how we are conformed to his image. We have to be offended first to be sanctified, don't we? (laughs) As a lost sinner, you hear the gospel, you receive Christ, and then when Christ is being preached biblically and his righteousness is being preached, you find out how bad you are. You find out the things in your life that are ungodly and disobedient and wrong, and that happened to me. And all of us get offended at that at first. So the question is, how will you respond to being offended? You could 
be so offended that you refuse and, and reject. And then he's simply a stumbling block in the way of the things you wanted to do. Or you can humble yourself and admit that God is right and I am wrong and I will change my ways and I will forsake my sin and I will amend my doings and then I'll be conformed to his image and I'll be more righteous than I, than I was before and I'll be more like Christ than I was before. That, that's the choice. Then he's the cornerstone. Then we're building. Otherwise, he's a stumbling block. And it's okay to be offended at first. Uh, I was... I had the world dripping off me. I had sin dripping off me when I got saved. And, uh, and I would go to church and I'd hear something preached against that I didn't really, maybe deep down I probably knew was wrong if I were honest. But, uh, but you hear about it and you, no, that can't be, no, but not mine. And you kind of justify it and maybe argue with God. No, it couldn't, how could that be wrong? And so, but you keep listening. Well, I'm going to look that up and see if that's really so. Yeah, they all checked out I was wrong. <laughs> I had to quit doing that. Whatever that was, I had to knock it off. And, and so you just get over being offended, and it really makes a difference. But those that refuse to uh, re- just re- they remain offended, they, for him, they're stum- it's his stumbling block. So number one, rejection. Number two, a sure cornerstone. A sure cornerstone. And we'll be brief here. Uh, no coincidence that Isaiah would use this phrase cornerstone in the context in Isaiah 28 of looking to pagan peoples for, for help when they should be going to God for help. Uh, they were this agreement with Egypt. They were essentially agreeing to serve the gods of the Egyptian underworld. That's that's pretty low, and and that has to do with cornerstones here because there was a a, a norm or a cultural custom in pagan societies where, uh, and we talked about this a little bit a few Sunday mornings ago when we talked about our, our temperament, and uh, a lot of these pagan societies believed. The sun and moon and stars, the elements of creation, you know, not the creator, but the creature, that those were the things that determined their success, their prosperity. The sun, moon and stars, not the maker of the sun, moon and stars, but the sun, moon and stars themselves regulated life and regulated fortune and regulated success. And so that controlled what kind of personality they have, but it would also control whether or not a building they build would be successful. And so when they go to build a building, well, it's got to be facing just right. It's got to be facing a certain direction and it's got to align with the sun, moon and stars and it's got to be right under the stars or else uh, it'll be cursed. Uh, And so that's the pagan belief. And so they would really agonize over where the cornerstone was set so that it would align with the stars. And uh, and oftentimes at the time when the cornerstone was put in place, they would do sacrifices to their gods. In fact, they even place a sacrifice on the cornerstone to win the approval of the gods of the the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all these things. And so it's no wonder that Isaiah would use an agreement with a pagan people to drop in this analogy of Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah, as the cornerstone. And and we find that it won't work. Verse 18, it's going to be disannulled. It's not going to work. Your agreement with hell shall not stand. You know, you you shook hands with the devil that that he might protect you, and he won't, and he can't. And the enemies are coming anyway. God is is saying to them, you could make agreements with 75 other armies and governments and nations, and I'm still able to bring an enemy against you. You can think that you've you've made an agreement with everybody in the world not to attack you. I'll bring an enemy still. God is saying, I'm just looking for you to trust me, and I'll handle it. But if you're going to go around uh, trying to make friends with everybody and and keeping, you know, preventing enemies from coming, God says, "I'll, I'll bring an enemy from a place you didn't even know existed. I'll bring an enemy from Siberia. I'll bring an enemy from some powerful and corner of the world. I can do that. And so they're going to overflow, run roughshod, overflow and scourge. But then he tells them here that, you know, that, uh, that, that version of a cornerstone is unsure and faulty. But Jesus Christ as a cornerstone in verse 16 is tried. He's tried. He's proven. Others have given him the rightful place of the cornerstone in their lives and found him to be sure, found him to be strong, have found that the building always aligns just right when they make him the cornerstone of their lives. He always uh, causes their life to endure. That's why church is important. That's why fellowship is important. Uh, Every time we feel alone, we need to be reminded that there are others that have tried to make the Lord Jesus the cornerstone of their lives, and he's, he's proved himself to them. And he's tried and he's proven. And when I might be struggling or in a weak, uh, weak in the faith, if I remember that 
countless others before me, generations gone by, they've tried to live for him and they've received him and they've allowed him to be the cornerstone of their lives. And he's proved himself to be sure that he can uh, has the strength to withstand and endure uh, as a, anything, any pressure that comes to bear on the, the building of that house. Uh, Paul again refers to this analogy here in Ephesians chapter 2. The beauty of the cornerstone, one of the many beauties of the cornerstone, is that it, man, it can be for anybody. Jesus can be the cornerstone of your life no matter what you look like, no matter how old you are, no matter how tall you are, no matter what you weigh, no matter what you look like. You could have, you know, you could be from any place, any ethnicity. And it's ethnicity in which Paul refers to this analogy in Ephesians 2.20. He says, now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, cornerstone from Isaiah 28. And it's in the context of anyone who's saved. You don't think of them. Don't he's telling saved Jews not to think of saved Gentiles as foreigners and strangers. He's saying they're part of the household of God. Now you got to let them into the house. You're in the house of Jesus Christ with him as the cornerstone. And it's a house when he's the cornerstone that can accommodate anybody. And so don't look down on Gentiles. Don't look down on Greeks. Don't look down on any skin color or ethnicity as being inferior or less than. You're in Christ now. It says the same thing in Galatians. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Uh, and so it's ironic, I think, that many of the voices today that are the loudest against, loudest and, and most uh most fervent against racism happen to also reject the cornerstone. Well, he's the cornerstone of Jesus Christ is the best reason to not be racist. It's the best reason to, to not look down on somebody else because of their skin color, because Ephesians 2 20 says, don't call them any more strangers and foreigners. Welcome them into the household of faith, into the household of God. The, the household of God can accommodate anybody if they come through the door of Jesus Christ and build their life on the on the uh, on the stone, the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. So don't look down on. A, I mean, you got to have a very strong uh, as a cornerstone. You got to be pretty strong if you can keep welcoming more people into the house. Uh, <laughs> any other weaker cornerstone is going to give way, but the cornerstone of Christ is so strong that more can keep coming in, and the house of the house of God, household of God, stays standing. The true remedy for racism is, is the cornerstone of Christ. Um, boy, that really affects missions too. You, you let that particular sin of looking down on people because of their, their skin tone, that's really going to affect your mission. Because are you really going to try to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature no matter where they're from? If, if you think some of them are less than? Uh, I would venture to say that when that, that particular sin of, of prejudice against skin colors creeps into a church, they're no longer a mission by the church. You, you've got to be looking at every person living in this world from every part of it as a potential newcomer into the household of God. No, no longer a stranger, no longer a foreigner. Lastly, number three, a precious cornerstone. Rejected, and, uh, and the last one there was a sure cornerstone. Lastly, number three, a precious cornerstone. You know what the word precious means? Something that is of extreme importance. Something that you cannot... Be without, cannot live without, it's precious to you. And Peter was very fond of that word. In Peter's epistles, he used the word precious to describe a lot of different things. He used the word precious to describe the trying of your faith. You don't like going through trials. I don't like going through trials. But Peter said that the, uh, the trying of our faith is more precious than of gold or silver that perish. We spend our lives uh, working to get our paycheck of gold and silver, but... but uh, Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Peter says, the trial of our faith is more precious than the gold or the silver. Uh, he said that the blood of Christ is precious uh, in chapter 1. It's more precious. Uh, it, why? Because it's of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's precious. It's rare. It's scarce. Things that are precious are rare and obscure and hard to find. That's why they have value. And there's no other blood that's ever been shed that's been sinless, perfect, Human blood, it was precious, not a single blemish, not a single moral flaw. And he also said in his second epistle that the promises of God are precious, exceeding great and precious promises. Man, they're, 
They're not precious because they're rare. They're precious because of their immense value. Cling to a promise of God. Find one and cling to it, and you'll find that it's true. But he also uses the word precious to describe the cornerstone the way Isaiah does. Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone, a precious cornerstone. First Peter chapter two. You can turn there if you can get there quickly. I'm going to turn there. Peter is going to use that same phrase. First Peter two, verse five. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. Same analogy, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Okay, so that's Isaiah 28. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. That's Psalm 118. Verse 8, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, that's Isaiah 8, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. And so you can see how Peter brings all that triangle of verses together and quotes them all together. They're part of the same analogy. But what he's saying is that Jesus Christ is the precious one. He's the rare one. He's so rare that he's one of a kind. And it's very interesting that that would come from Peter. Because the Roman Catholic Church says that, no, the cornerstone is not Jesus, it's Peter. That's how they justify popes and someone being Christ in the world, uh, you know, and, and the bowing down to a pope and the, you know, the worshiping and veneration of a pope and the infallibility of a pope. They get that from saying that uh, in Matthew uh, 16, it is, I think it is, that, uh, you know, the exchange, well, well so Peter must be the stone. Upon this stone, I'll build my church. Of course, Jesus is speaking of himself and the confession in himself. But but so let's ask Peter what he says about it. All right, Peter, who's the precious one? Uh, because Peter's the one writing First Peter 2. And here he himself says, it's not me. It's Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. He's the one. He is the indispensable one. He is the necessary one. We've got to we've got to have him. Let's make a point to build all the things that have to do with the, the, the building of our lives, that they